So thanks, everyone, uh, for coming to listen to this talk. Uh, my name is Ian Houston. I'm going to talk a little bit about Python on Cloud Foundry. Um, and yeah, thank you very much to, to James and Leah and all the organizers for putting on such a great conference. I'm really excited to be able to speak here. Um, I was actually here at the New York PyData conference last year, and it's great to see it's keeping going, and it's expanded so far around the world. There's even one in London now, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, but who am I? So uh, my Twitter account is up there. I just tweeted a link, uh, which is actually at the bottom, about uh, which is collecting a lot of the resources for this talk. So code, and there's a video as well, which I'll show later, and just some uh, you know, further reading for you if you want to get in, uh, interested in how to do this kind of thing. Um, my GitHub account is there, uh, but me, myself, I'm a data scientist. I work at Pivotal. Um, and I use the PyData stack day to day for predictive analytics and machine learning. Uh, before that, I was actually a theoretical physicist. So I was actually using Python for high performance computing and numerical simulations, using things like SunGrid Engine and clusters and all that sort of thing as well. Before I get into Cloud Foundry, I just want to yeah, quickly shout out about PyData London. Um, this is a meetup group that was started after the first PyData London conference. And we've been hosting it at Pivotal for the last six months, um, but they've grown so large. They've grown from zero to 700 plus members since May. Um, the organizer, Ian Oswald, uh, likes to tell James Powell that it's actually the fastest growing Python data meetup. Um, it's not the biggest yet, but we're growing fastest. Um, the next London conference is actually already being sort of arranged, and it's actually going to be in June next year. So if anyone's in Europe or in London, um, try and head to that. Uh, there's actually, this is a picture taken in our offices when the World Cup was on. That's why there's all English flags there in the foreground. Today, though, I'm going to talk about Cloud Foundry, and in particular, I want to talk about Python on Cloud Foundry. Uh, how many people have actually heard of Cloud Foundry before? Okay, a few. So Cloud Foundry is an, an open source cloud platform, or a platform as a service, I suppose uh, people describe it as. The idea is that it's a you know, simple way for developers to deploy applications, scale them, and make them highly available. For the back-end people, it sort of uh, takes away all the hassle of spinning up servers or spinning up you know, the config for Apache or the load balancing, et cetera, and tries to like, make that whole process extremely easy. And the idea is that it also enables you to be cloud independent somewhat. So you, you don't get locked in maybe to Amazon Web Services or Google Compute Engine or Microsoft Azure and have like that kind of uh, cost of ever having to move from one of those to another one if, say, the prices go up or you know, the whole system goes down like Azure did last week. So as I said, Cloud Foundry is an open source platform. It was first developed at VMware and then became part of Pivotal when Pivotal started last year. And we're still leading the open source development, but we've actually got quite a lot of partners involved now in developing the open source project. Um, we're building this Cloud Foundry Foundation, which is, I suppose, sort of a similar idea to you know, the Python Software Foundation or the Apache Foundation. And it's basically a governing body that helps direct the, the development and uh, promotion of Cloud Foundry. All these big names are involved, you know, IBM, HP, uh, SAP, and uh, you know, some further people down there. Interesting, Canonical is on there. And in fact, Cloud Foundry ships with uh, Ubuntu Server now. So it's actually, you know, becoming quite a big part of the, the stack. The one slide overview of Cloud Foundry for developers and data scientists um, would be this. So if I have a directory or I have an app in a directory, I want to push it. I want to actually deploy it into real live uh, website. All I have to do is CF push. I don't need to go and you know, install Apache, go install whatever, you know, Python interpreter, go install all my packages. All I need to do is do CF push, and it, the system actually takes care of everything itself. It does some introspection. It goes finds what your package needs, and sets it all up for you, sets up some sane defaults for things like load balancing. And, and you can take advantage of that by scaling up your app. So you, know, you can go from one instance to five instances just with a straightforward command. You can change the memory allocation, the disk allocation, et cetera. An interesting thing for you know, data science and sort of data people is that you can actually bind data services into your application. And so we have, you know, I'll talk a little bit later about all the different types of data services, but things like Redis, RabbitMQ, Cassandra, those kind of things. You can spin those up, start them, and then connect them into your little app um, without actually much, much hassle in the back end. You don't need to go off and install Cassandra yourself and do all that yourself. So for data scientists, I think it's like a productivity booster. 
Um, you know, I find myself often having to just make little, you know, single web page apps um, to display results or to show a customer something I've done. Um, and if I needed to go and like try and, uh, in the old days, I suppose, provision a server, set it all up, but in the sort of cloud days, go to AWS, spin something up there, use the management console, do all that. Um, it just takes a little bit more time. So this is actually just a really quick and simple way of doing this. For like the sort of enterprise people who've had to, you know, do this over their hundreds of servers that they may have internally, this is kind of the big difference. You know, you go from having to set up everything, you know, 50 configuration touches to set up your domain name, set up the load balancing, set up Apache the way you want, you know, whatever you need to do. Um, now you just actually do, do one kind of really straightforward uh, configuration in the back end. So I think the example that they give when they, when they talk about this to large industries or large enterprises is Morgan Stanley, who have about 20 full-time engineers just maintaining and deploying Tomcat servers uh, throughout the organization. You're just finding Tomcat servers, you know, updating them, keeping them, uh, you know, the configs right, and refreshing them and installing them and uh, doing all that kind of thing. But I kind of want to talk about Python and Cloud Foundry, and Python's actually a first-class language. Um, along with some others like Go, Ruby, and Java, and Node.js, and even PHP for some reason. Um, and the official sort of system actually automatically detects if you have a Python application. So you didn't know, don't need to tell Cloud Foundry that you've written a Python app. It'll actually go and do things like it looks for a requirements.txt file, for example, or it looks for .py extensions uh, in your directory. And it'll decide, OK, this is a Python uh, application. What do I need to do? So what it does is it goes and installs a Python interpreter for you. It goes, uses pip to install any of your dependencies, and, and then it starts the application as requested. So you, you can either put in, you know, if you're using Flask, say, which I'm going to show you later, you can just put in Python myapp.py or whatever, and that's how the, the server will be started. You can do lots of other things as well if you want to. Okay, so I wanted to just show what a simple, has everyone used Flask before? Or they kind of know the idea? It's kind of a very simple uh, sort of, I suppose, low footprint Python web server, and you can just you know, make a web app in a few, like five or 10 lines um, that just serves a page or whatever. Uh, I just want to show how easy it is to actually do that in Cloud Foundry. I think because the Wi-Fi wasn't working up here, I'm going to do this as a video. And um, hopefully you can see it. So I'm just going to talk through. This is on YouTube, so you can actually go look at it later. So these are the files I have in my app. This is the Flask app, really straightforward. The one thing here is I have to find the port. So Cloud Foundry tells me the port in this environmental variable. Um, and then I just tell Flask to start with that port. Requirements.txt is just Flask. And then there's this proc file or a manifest file that just tells you how to start the app. So Python hello.py in this case. And then I said it's just CF push and just give your app a name here. Um, and what it'll do is, first of all, it'll upload. You know, I'm logged into this uh, environment here as a pivotal data science environment. It goes, it creates a domain name for you, just automatically, based on your app name, or you can tell it what domain name you want. Uploads the application, which is here, just four files. And then it goes to try and start this. So it figures out, OK, what do I need? Right, I need a Python application. So I need to install an interpreter. I need to install uh, with pip all the requirements. Goes and does that. You can see it installing things like Flask and Jinja. Um, and then it has put all of this into a container. These aren't quite yet Docker containers. They're actually something different. I can talk about that later. But it's built a container, and then it goes and starts the application. And then it's running. And here we can see the URL. You can see the state down there. It's using like 50 megabytes of memory at the moment. And I can go and see that the application is actually running. It's, it's a very simple web app at the moment. It just says, hello, world. We can actually go back and then scale up, as I said. So scale up, say, to five instances. Um, and it's just as simple as doing this. And because it has everything in the container, it just immediately um, is able to say, OK, we've now scaled up to five instances. So now go back. I just want to check just by refreshing. And you can see that the port has actually changed. So that's the load balancer has automatically realized there's five instances and just uh, send the request to each of those. So that's great. Um, and you know, for simple web apps, simple Flask apps, and you know, other things, uh, really useful. But that build pack is actually using um, pip, as we saw. So I'm going to talk a little bit later about how we go beyond that, especially at a conference like PyData, where I think everyone knows the sort of problems you have if you try and install NumPy or, or SciPy using pip. Just before that, though, I want to talk about those data services. So to, 
to get access to, say, you know, database or NoSQL uh, service or a message queue or something like that, it's really as simple as just you know, a few command line uh, commands. So create service, maybe I want a, a Redis cloud, so that's actually a sort of third party provider of Redis instances in the cloud. Um, so I want to use the, the Redis cloud service. The plan name is just you know, their uh, billing plans, and I want to call it something instance name. Then I just bind it to my app. And that's actually provided again in an environmental variable uh, to my application. So um, if you're you know, in Python, all you need to do is go look at the environmental variables um, and see if one exists called VCAP app services. And then it actually gives you all the details. So it gives you the port, it gives you the URL, the host name, and it gives you the password and username into that service. So that's a very easy way of um, letting your app actually access a service like this. And you can do interesting things like having, you know, test and uh, production uh, data services. So you could have a test Redis service and a production Redis service which, which, with different data, and you could then switch over them between them very easily because you're, you don't actually need to have change any code in your application. So here are some of the services that are available at the moment on uh, Pivotal CF, which is Pivotal's sort of packaged Cloud Foundry instance. Um, and there's other ones uh, available on the other different types of Cloud Foundry that are out there. Uh, but you know, you see interesting things like so Pivotal HD is a Hadoop distribution, but Mongo, Cassandra, and Redis and Rabbit, and even Jenkins is now as a service. So you can actually spin up Jenkins servers um, using Cloud Foundry and then connect to them. Uh, so you just have your workflow working like that. Okay. So as I said, we're at a Pi Data conference, so I kind of wanted to go beyond just using pip to install this kind of thing. So obviously, if you try to use pip uh, without being able to you know, manually change the library paths for SciPy or install a Fortran compiler and all those things, it's very difficult. Try and do that in an automated fashion at one remove on a, a server, um, it gets much harder. So you know, uh, we have, this problem is solved. So uh, Conda Packaging Manager enables you to do all this using binary packages. So I wanted to build a, uh, create a build pack, which is this sort of set of instructions for Cloud Foundry to say how to install the environment necessary to run your application. I wanted to do that, but for the PyData stack. So basically, I've, I've written this it's, uh, at GitHub. Um, and what it does is it, first of all, goes and looks at a file called conda requirements, installs all those conda packages, and then goes and installs the requirements.txt file using pip. So you know. Some packages aren't on Conda, or they don't have packages built for them, um, but they are on PyPy, so you can actually go and do both of those things at the same time. So you can even, uh, even use this to provision your own IPython notebook server, but you know, that, that's at your own risk, because obviously it's open to the world. Um, and in fact, these days, I suppose, if everyone, everyone's heard of the TempNB service nowadays? If you haven't heard of it, go to it. Uh, it's really interesting. They've, I think it's Rackspace have um, basically set up Docker containers with IPython Notebook, and instantly you go to that server and it'll spin up, spin up a Docker container and give you access to that Docker container with IPython. So you get your own IPython spun up immediately. So I probably wouldn't recommend doing that on Cloud Foundry right now, mainly because the uh, you know the time or sorry the security implications of that. Um, but what I have been able to do, uh, in fact, just since uh, the other day was um, do something else. So what web application that uses the PyData stack might be interesting? Well, yesterday there was a good talk uh, about Spire, which is kind of like an R shiny equivalent for Python. Um, some simple, simple syntax that actually gets you to uh, put different widgets together with uh, different plots and enables you to interact with that very quickly. Uh, so if you didn't see that talk yesterday, um, I'm sure it's going to be on the uh, website, uh, the video. But this is a little Spire app that uh, was shown in the talk yesterday, and I've actually just pushed it to Cloud Foundry. So um, can, oh, make sure I have internet here. Um, this goes and gets stock ticker information and just goes and then creates the, the, uh, the image here, the graph here. And there's also a table in the background, so you can you know, change all this sort of stuff. But that's it. You know, it didn't actually take me very much to go from um, the sample application for Spire, which is, uses Cherry Pie in the back end, and I literally, I think I had to change one line to actually give it the port that it needs to have to, to know to listen on, um, and then just CF push, and that immediately now is available, and um, that's online, you can go to that URL if you want. I'll leave it up for a bit. 
Um, and it's actually scaled up, so it's scaled up to like four or five instances. So if there was like massive load on this all of a sudden, um, it wouldn't actually, uh, there wouldn't actually be a major problem generating these graphs very quickly. So those are the kind of interesting things that I think you can do with Cloud Foundry. Um, I suppose in the past, Cloud Foundry has been quite a bit sort of maybe Java and Ruby focused. Um, but the sort of big thing I want to get across is Python is now a, a first class citizen. And I was talking to the, the people who developed the Python build pack on Friday. Uh, they're actually here in New York in the Pivotal Labs office. Um, and if you have any feedback about that, they're really interested to hear how people are using it. So build packs are this idea that comes from Heroku. Um, and in fact, the Python build pack being used by Cloud Foundry at the moment is the Heroku build pack with some minor modifications. They're interested to see what else they can do with it. Um, so if you have any suggestions or you use it or something breaks, um, just get in touch with them or you can get in touch with me and I'll put you through to them. Okay, just to wrap up, um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about why this would be useful. I kind of mentioned these things already. As a data scientist, I kind of find I need to you know, uh, deliver my results to someone, and often outside my organization. So it can't be you know, just sharing something on uh, our you know, Google Drive or whatever. And, and you want to make something interactive and something nice and visually appealing. But it might be that this is quite short-lived, and it might be it only needs to be around for a few weeks, maybe. And so you don't want to get into the hassle of setting up you know, uh, full domain and all that sort of uh, thing in the back end. So Cloud Foundry, for me, provides a really simple way of pushing those kind of simple, straightforward things really quickly. And when you need to, you can get access to the data services in the back end. And as I said before, you don't really get locked into, you know, Amazon Web Services hikes its prices next week, but everything I've writ ever written is locked into that. Um, and I now can't switch to one of the other providers. If you want to have a go at this, um, Pivotal, my employer, uh, runs this service called Pivotal Web Services. Uh, there's a free trial on there. It's just run.pivotal.io. You can go there and uh, check it out from the client side. And you, know, you won't get access to the, the back end of it, but you can push applications. And there's um, you know, uh, quite an interesting pricing model for how much that uh, uses. IBM have their version of Cloud Foundry. They call it Bluemix. And, and you can go there as well. They're doing some interesting things in the data science space uh, with sort of data science uh, models that you're able to sort of immediately bring into Cloud Foundry. Any9s is a German company, so if you're interested in German uh, data protection laws, their uh, uh, data centers are purely in Germany, so that's kind of their, their unique selling point. And HP have just announced they're going to do something with Cloud Foundry as well in this Helion thing. Okay, as I said, the sort of materials for this talk uh, are at that uh, URL. Uh, they're just on my blog, so it's in Houston.net. Cloud Foundry is there. The Flask, if you want to use Flask for data science, there's a tutorial called the Flask Mega Meta Tutorial for Data Science. And it kind of builds on this other tutorial that's called the Flask Mega Tutorial. Um, but it has a lot of resources about you know, how could you use Flask for data science kind of activities. Um, what does it mean to sort of push data in this kind of way? Um, and if you're really interested in getting into these kind of cloud-based applications, the kind of architecture you need, the kind of thinking you need to do about, you know, my storage is ephemeral, it's going to go away, my app is going to get updated and restarted at will without me being able to do anything about it. And these, all these ideas are encapsulated in this 12-factor apps um, sort of idea. So there's like, uh, on that website you can go down and see how should I design my application in order to be sort of cloud friendly these days. And if you want to learn more about Cloud Foundry, there's lots of meetups uh, all across the world, and they're kind of collated on that meetup page. But that's it for me. Um, I can talk a little bit more about Docker if anyone's interested, but I'm happy to take questions right now first. Please. No questions at all. Has anyone ever used Cloud Foundry before? It's kind of... Uh... So the way, I suppose the way to think about this is this lives on top of Amazon Web Services and other providers. So for example, the, the Pivotal Web Services thing, that actually all, that lives on top of Amazon Web Services. You never see like AWS console, you never see any of that. Um, but that's provided, like that's where it's running, the sort of substrate. But it could also be on you know, a private cloud in your own internal uh, data center on like vSphere or something like that. Um, as a user, you shouldn't, Ever get to need, ever need to have to interact with AWS, 
Um, Cloud Foundry, the whole idea is it's for large installations. Like if you're pushing one app, you don't want to spin up your own Cloud Foundry, you want to use one of these hosted services. But if you're an organization that has 100, 200 applications, or maybe you're building microservices and each one of those needs to be running, um, you want to do this in a cloud independent way. That's kind of the idea. Yeah, like this isn't, you know, as I said, this isn't for just set up a whole Cloud Foundry instance for one application. Like there's a fair amount of back end that goes into it. Um, but people have done it on, um, I think, something like, you know, maybe, I think, I think there's a sort of limit of the, you need a certain number of VMs to start off with. So maybe it's 10 or 15 VMs um, running all the different services. So there's like a, you know, a staging manager service, a droplet execution manager, and um, they kind of run all those things in the back end. And then you need somewhere to put the applications. So 10, yeah, I think. Yeah. Yeah, this lives on OpenStack as well, yeah. Ooh, I don't, I don't know yet. I think, you know, there's a few, yeah, I'm not like deep in the, the, the weeds of that, like actually setting it up myself. Um, but you can definitely talk to, talk to uh, Pivotal about it. And, Part of the sort of thing we do with Pivotal CF is packaging those things in a really easy way to actually install and manage. So um, maybe the open source version still needs a little bit of hand holding, um, but the packaged versions are a bit easier. So yeah, they can be provided as a service, basically. Um, so yeah, and you know, for example, we had Hadoop there as one of the possible services, so that you know, it's really providing HDFS, um, you know, as a, a storage layer. Um, but again, that you know, if you're doing that in Cloud Foundry, you might want to think about the sort of uh, persistence of that. Um, you can actually create your own user-defined service, which is as simple as you know, basically giving whatever the resource URI is. Um, and the you know, username and password and just telling Cloud Foundry about that and then it can give those in the environmental variable I talked about to uh, any of your applications. Okay. There are there any other questions? If not, uh, then I'll stop there. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>